next week, starting at 5 o'clock. So y'all ready? Okay, Lord, we pray for your blessings on our time. Everybody here and everybody watching online in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get going as soon as this gets switched over. Here we go. And there we go. Jesus is coming. The preparation is almost done. It is so, so, so close. And we're going to see this with Daniel. Daniel had visions of what was coming. Uh, uh, tonight it's going to be with Alexander the Great in part one of chapter eight. And uh, we're going to see next time, not next week, because David Tal and Don Stewart will be here the Sunday after that, how all of these things that Daniel is prophesying through the Greek Empire um, in the second half of chapter 8 are going to become fulfilled in the Antichrist that is still coming. And how we're going to see tonight how God used Alexander the Great to prepare the world, believe it or not, for the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to see how all of that works out. In fact, God even used Alexander the Great to get us this Bible. And we're going to see that in a few minutes too. Uh, with this, all of the preparation that's almost done, uh, we can see in that, we actually see the signs. So uh, here's this. Uh, we're all hearing about the coronavirus. Uh, lots of news coming out about it. Um, Senator calls for immediate shutdown of all flights from China to the U.S. Uh, now breaking, this is actually yesterday, I think. Uh, computer models show 183 million affected by coronavirus uh, by February 29th. So that's the end of this month. Um, what else do we have? Drudge Report, who World Health Organization declares emergency cases spike tenfold. Um, then there's this, how viral pandemic benefits the globalist agenda. This, I do believe. Um, I, I thought about this, that uh, I, I'm not saying that this is a weaponized uh, pestilence, the, this virus. Uh, might be, I don't know, okay? I, I read different articles and so forth. But you, it's not rocket science to figure out that enough people get sick and die from this, this uh, virus, how much we're going to start hearing you would need to get that vaccine. How much we're going to start hearing we need to control all these things, we need to submit, submit. How many people are going to, how many more people who aren't willing now are going to be more willing to submit to the global government because it's all about utopia, it's all about creating this perfect world. Uh, this, to me, this makes sense. Hey, we've got to save the world, we've got to save people, therefore we're, we're going to have to, it's going to bring about more laws, I do believe. Um, if this thing gets really bad, it will bring about more laws. Um, it might not. I don't know what's going to happen with this one. It could, it could uh, fade away. It could continue to increase. But I do know this much. Jesus said pestilence will increase. And um, so this is an alert for that. But it's not just this. E this. Ebola is still out there. And there's a lot of other viruses and diseases that are out there that we don't hear much about. But you look at this and you think... Um, you can start to work out the scenario and see which direction this is eventually going to go. And the things seem to be shaping up rather quickly. Then there's this. CNN's Don Lemon and guests mock Trump supporters as uneducated and illiterate. Now, I know, don't know how many of you saw this, but here you have a, a network that says anybody who votes for Trump or votes uh, conservative is dividing the country, and you're causing all this division, yet they throw in things like this constantly. It, but it just reminds me that the world's going to be more and more divided as nation is against nation, as Jesus said. You know what that Greek word for nation is? Ethnos. Get our English word ethnic, meaning people group. And as, as you said, it's going to be a people group against people group. It's going to increase in frequency and in intensity and that is all part of it. But man, it's just, uh, you look at this and you go, okay, who's really dividing everything? Um, but then, there's, let's see what this one, oh, Franklin Graham event canceled because he views gay marriage as sin. Uh, this is over in the UK. Anybody hear about this? A lot of you did, okay. This is over in the UK, and uh, they said, you're not going to host your event here. This is for 
uh, people coming to Christ, evangelistic vent here, because uh, your views are incompatible with our values. This is what you will hear more and more of. If you're a Christian, you believe in the Bible, your views are incompatible with the direction that the world's values are going. Uh, it's only a matter of time before the Bible is going to be illegal. You know it's illegal in a lot of countries right now, don't you? So in, here in America, uh, we're blessed, we're still able to have it out in the open, but you wonder, it's just a matter of time before that door closes. And you look at that, this and you realize, okay, we're not politically correct, our values are based upon the Bible. That's not the values that the world has. Um, and things, th these doors will continue to be shut more and more. I believe, personally, it is my own belief, um, that when I watch what's happening now in America and I watch the favor that President Trump is giving to evangelical Christians and Jews and churches and things like that, just in the verbal support, um, there's so much hatred against Trump at the same time that as soon as he's gone, eventually he's going to be gone. Whether it's this year or four years from now or something happens to him in between. Eventually he's going to be gone and we look and we, we can see this socialistic agenda. It's coming and I know it's coming because of what the Bible says and, and the way the, the, the uh, government is, the world government of the last days, it's going to be socialistic. Uh, and so it, I know it's coming. Um, but I look at it and think as soon as Trump's gone, this pendulum is going to swing so far and so fast, the opposite direction. You're going to wake up the next morning and go, uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem. I'm a believer in this country. Yeah, but but the, the glo there, there's a global agenda that's behind all this. And we forget these things. And the, the problem is that the Bible is against the global agenda. Um, anybody from China understands that the Bible is against the Chinese government. So you, when you get uh, something like that on a global scale, um, you can see why the Bible's outlawed in many places. Why Franklin Graham in a Western country uh, says, no, nah, nah, you're not bringing that in. It's incompatible with us. And then there's this, Auschwitz survivors warn of rising anti-Semitism 75 years on, 75 years since. Uh, so you look at this, and we also know that anti-Semitism is going to increase. It is increasing. It's increasing in, in the unbelievable numbers. Um, I hope that American Jews will wake up to uh, what is happening. Uh, Israeli Jews know what's happening. A lot of them, that's why they live there. Um, but uh, American Jews don't really see it quite as much, seeing it in New York and various places. Nevertheless. Uh, that will only increase. So these are just some of the signs. And we're, they're increasing. And so they are warnings for us. So Daniel, in Daniel chapter 8, where we are today, it's only going to be two parts with Daniel 8, and then we'll be in chapter 9. You know that chapter? That's the crazy chapter with the revived Roman Empire and the peace covenant with many. That's, that's Daniel chapter 9. Just two parts with Daniel 8. So think back, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had a vision. Remember that? Uh, of four different animals. It was the Babylonian kingdom, Medo-Persian, Greek, and then the Roman Empire. And then he saw a little horn. We looked at the little horn who's the Antichrist and the ten kingdoms. That's the new world order that is coming. We saw that. Well, in chapter 8, uh, Daniel also has um, uh, another vision. And uh, with this vision, what he's really focused on, he sees the Medo-Persian Empire in the beginning, and then it launches into the kingdom of Greece, the Greek empire with Alexander the Great. And we'll see next time that it's really also a picture, a prototype, what we see with uh, the Greek empire, a prototype of the Antichrist who's coming. So in, in uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. Uh, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, or the capital, which is the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Elam is in uh, modern-day Iran, uh, per ancient Persia. 
Uh, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will, and he became great. Let's stop here for for a couple of minutes. And we know what Daniel sees here. Uh, In this vision, he sees this ram in verses 1 through 4. In the book of Daniel, God has shown and will continue to show that Israel, and specifically Jerusalem, is the center of the world. Uh, When Jesus came to uh, this world, truth uh, in Jerusalem, the, the, excuse me, uh, Jerusalem became the truth center of the world, and currently Jerusalem is the storm center of the world. Uh, Not the storm center due to weather patterns and tornadoes and rain and hurricanes, but storm center regarding unrest and war and threats of destruction from the rest of the world. Uh, And as the political storm center, it's only going to continue to increase. Uh, We're going to see this with the Greek Empire landing and causing great problems for the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. But right now, uh, we look at something like this. So this is in the news. Uh, Donald Trump has his peace plan. You heard about that, right? Hard not to hear about that. Trump unveils Middle East peace plan with two-state solution and a tunnel connecting the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, That's kind of interesting to say the least. So this peace plan has been revealed. Uh, This was from Stephen Israel Instagram today. The streets, uh, the three-state solution, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, done deal, move on. You say, hey, we need to move on. We're constantly getting bombed by Hamas and Hezbollah. And uh, listen, the the Mideast needs to get with the program in Trump's peace deal. And then there's this, in shocking development, Arab nations across the Middle East support the Trump peace plan. The Arab nations, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, they're fed up with the whole Palestinian cause. Uh, This Palestinian cause has really been hijacked by the Palestinian Authority, and then Hamas is involved in it, and Hamas is a proxy of Iran, Uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Jordan all know the biggest problem they have over in the Middle East is Iran. And so they're concerned about Iran. They're going, wait a minute, Israel's our greatest protector. We need a strong Israel. We need to move on from this this, this stuff. And and the Palestinian Authority needs to enter into some type of an agreement with uh, Israel. So we're watching all of this happen. We're going to come back to the peace plan in a little bit. But, it, but Israel and Jerusalem is the storm center of the world. It was in the days of Daniel, um, but it, right now it, it is in the days of the last days and now. But right now in the vision that Daniel has, the storm center is this place called Susa or Shushan, which is the capital or the citadel of the Persian Empire. So it's going to be the Persian Empire deals with first noted by the ram, and then the Greek empire. So you guys tracking with me? Okay. Here in verse 1, Daniel has a vision. He tells us about it, and he tells us about the place. Daniel seems surprised in verse 1 that he has this vision. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel. Wow. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, wow. After the first, I already had one. Now I get another one. This is kind of weird. And then we have the place. I already mentioned the place is Susa or Shushan, the capital of the uh, Persian Empire. Perhaps you recall both Nehemiah and Esther and their references to Susa or Shushan, the capital, uh, which came, Nehemiah and Esther came after uh, the time of Daniel, when the Jews by Cyrus were released to go back to um, Jerusalem, right? So Nehemiah, he's the one who built the wall around the city. And uh, it came to pass in the month of his love, uh, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel. Uh, Esther also makes reference to Susan, uh, Shushan, the citadel. In those days when King Ahasuerus, 
sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel. Simply, it's the capital of the area. So all of these things are connected. So we have the place, we have the vision, the place, and we also have the animal. Again, the animal is a ram. So this ram has two horns, and one of the horns is higher than the other. Why is that? Uh, because this is, was originally the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, hence the two horns. And then Daniel says that one horn the, so, is higher than the other. The Persian Empire became the dominating uh, arm, or in this case, horn, of the Medo-Persian Empire and eventually completely dominated the Medes. It's interesting that Daniel saw a ram in this vision as representing the Persian Empire because Amenas, uh, I don't know how to say his name, M, whatever it is, uh, whatever, Marcellinus, a 4th century historian stated, I wasn't alive in the 4th century, so I wasn't sure exactly how to say that. A 4th century historian stated that the Persian ruler bore the head of a ram as he stood at the head of his army. So Daniel's got this vision way before it actually happens of the ram representing the Medo-Persian Empire, the Persian Empire, and here you have this wearing, this, wearing this ram's head. And then Lehman Strauss noted the ram was the national emblem of Persia, a ram being stamped on Persian coins as well as on the headdress of Persian empires. Uh, but Daniel's vision, it goes past the Persian Empire all the way through to Alexander the Great. And this is where it really starts to get interesting. Verse 5, as I was considering, in other words, the ram, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth. It's just flying. You can see this thing. It's just flying across the whole earth. And speaking of speed. Uh, without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. He's got one horn on this goat. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him. He attacked the ram and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. All right, so what is all this about? This is about Alexander the Great, and then after he dies, how the kingdom of Greece was divided between his four generals. Why does it matter with Bible prophecy? I'll show you. So here, what do we have? We have the goat that takes out the ram. We have Alexander the Great who eliminates the Persian Empire. This passage that we just read is one of the most amazing in the prophetic word. Why is that? It's because of the accuracy of its predictions. This passage has bothered scholars, secular and religious scholars, for a long, long, long time. So much does it bother them that they say that Daniel had to be written after the Greek Empire because there's no way anybody on this planet could possibly predict with such accuracy what Daniel has predicted regarding the Greek Empire. Sadly, many churches in the Western world, in America, go that way also. They just say, it's a strange thing. People will say in churches, I believe the Bible is absolutely true. But then when they're confronted with something that seems miraculous or impossible, they'll say, well, I believe it, but I just don't believe that. Well, what is it that you believe? It was, uh, I, I think it was uh, Thomas Edison that um, uh, had his own Bible. I think it was Edison. No, no, Thomas Jefferson. He had a, what he did is he took the pages of the Bible. Edison was the light bulb guy, right? Okay, so um, he took the pages of the Bible, the passages that he didn't believe, the miracles of Jesus, he cut out. He said, well, these things can't be, they're just too absurd. I can't believe them. So he pasted his own Bible, what he believed was believable. And that's what people have done with the book of Daniel. They said, no, nope, this is unbelievable. It's impossible that anybody could predict beforehand what comes. 
Nevertheless, this is written by God through the hands of men. God tells us in Isaiah 46, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me. He's not a man. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. I'm telling you beforehand so that you can know that you can believe this and when it came to the first coming of Christ you could know it and when it comes to passages like this that we can also believe the Bible for the second coming of Christ and the Jews can believe it when they would read these things about Alexander the Great and then his four generals when they would come and bring in this, and the one Antiochus Epiphanes who would come later on, he would, he would bring about this great holocaust to kill all the Jews. They would be strengthened and they'd say, wait a minute, the Bible told us how long this is going to last and what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you this, what's going to happen in the ultimate end, Jesus comes back and Israel wins. But God says, I will do it. He declares then from the beginning, he goes on saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure, not a portion of it. I'm not going to, I'll fulfill 98% of it. I'll fulfill 99% of it. I'll fulfill 97. I'll fulfill, no, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I will do all my pleasure. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. I, I love that. I've spoken it. I purposed it. I'm going to do it. Every bit of it. In this passage, as we check out the accuracy of God's Word, we have the animal that is listed here. Now, again, uh, this animal here is the goat. So it goes from the ram to the goat. The goat took out the ram. This, this goat had one horn, eliminates the Persian Empire. Um, this fact that Daniel has this vision of a goat representing Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire is a huge part of the reason why historians say this is impossible. It's way too accurate. Uh, uh, think of this. Note that the first Greek colony was established by an oracle that sent a goat for a guide to build a city. Did you know that? The goat came to the region of Greece, and in gratitude for the goats leading them in the right direction, they called the city AJ, I'm guessing I'm saying that right, like the Asian sea, um, meaning the goat city. So the goat goes and it says, this is where the city is going to be. They follow the goat, and that's where they put the city. Hence, the name of the sea upon whose shores the city was built was named the Asian sea or the goat sea. So, so Daniel sees this goat representing the Greek empire. Note, not only the accuracy of the goat some 200 years before it came to pass, but note here, there were six additional fulfilled prophecies. Again, the reason why historians say it's impossible, it's way too accurate. Listen, I look at all of the prophecies regarding the first coming of Christ, every one of them were accurate. All of the prophecies of the second coming of Christ, every one of them will be accurate. Accurate. In the passage we read, we were told that this goat rose from the west and it covered the earth without touching the ground, and a notable horn was between its eyes. And when he came to the ram, the Persian Empire, he ran at it, he raged against it, it broke its two horns, cast him down, and trampled him, and the male goat, Alexander, became great. Regarding the six additional prophecies, the Greek Empire rose from the west of previous empires. Verse 5 tells us that's how it's going to be. The Greek empire rose with great speed. The, the, uh, the goat doesn't even touch the ground. It just flies across the face of the earth. History tells us that the Greeks built a kingdom like no other. In 12 years, they conquered the entire civilized world without losing a battle. That is impressive. Greece became the dominant force in the world faster than any other kingdom before it. And God said, this is how it would happen 200 years before it did. Alexander the Great is the notable horn. Check this out. While growing up, his mother taught him that he was the descendant of Achilles and Hercules. Now that's going to build up the self-esteem of your child. It's no wonder that Alexander was motivated 
His father was Philip of Macedon, and historians record that Alexander spent much of his time as a young boy worrying that when he had the chance, there wouldn't be anything left for him to conquer because his father was such a great military leader. Fourth one, the Greek Empire destroyed the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel saw him attack the ram furiously, shattering the horn. The ram was powerless against the goat. When Alexander decided to take down the Medo-Persian Empire, he came at them with 35,000 troops from the west, crossed over the Hellespont, and then he swept south and took Egypt, Tyre, and Gaza. Then he retraced his steps through Syria and came to an enlarged Persian army and completely destroyed and humiliated them. And then, the sixth one, regarding the death of Alexander the Great. Verse 8 tells us that the goat became very great. Alexander became very great, but at the height of his power, the large horn, he's the large horn, was broken off. At the age of 33, Alexander died from his own drunkenness and depression. Why was he given to drunkenness and depression? Likely because shortly before his death, he was seen weeping loudly because there were no more worlds for him to conquer. At the age of 33, that is just crazy. As great as he was, Alexander was nothing more than a tool in the hand of God. Uh, You look back, let's just go back 15 years, 20 years, right? Uh, 25 years, I'll tell you, let's go back 30 years. Uh, uh, George Bush, I think it was the W, was the one that's, uh, the first one, right? I get them mixed up. So he's the one that coined that phrase, well, coined it from president's standpoint. It's been around for a long time. Uh, The new world order. We're marching toward a new world order. Uh, We're going to have this unity. It's going to be this global government. You see certain people that have been raised up in the history of the United States. Um, and then you have um, Henry Kissinger. And you start looking at people that are globalists that are within the government of the United States of America. Here's the deal. In order for the Bible to come about the way the Bible describes it's going to in the last days, the United States of America has to be swallowed up in this globalist system. That's why I talk about these things with warnings, and I can see what's coming with socialism. Again, we'll get to that in just a couple more minutes. Uh, but you go from Bush, and then you, 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 you look at Clinton, and then you look at the next Bush, and then you look at Obama, and, uh, and John Kerry, and, and Condoleezza Rice, and you look at all these different uh, people in different places of leadership, and you realize something. If you look at your Bible, you start to realize, wait, wait a minute, God has placed them here. As God used Alexander the Great to prepare the world, which we're going to see more in just a second, it's absolutely fascinating, God has used these people, and God is using Donald Trump right now, for whatever reason he's using him. Um, he's using Boris Johnson over in, over in the UK. He's using Benjamin Netanyahu. And he's also using Vladimir Putin. And when you start looking at all of these things coming together, I mean, I can look over at China and see the the social credit system they have, and I can look at that and go, wow, that is already in place, and a system that's even going to be more advanced than that is exactly what the Antichrist is going to have. These things have to be developed, and I look at these things, and I just find them absolutely fascinating. Now, check this out. Although Alexander didn't realize it, the fact of the matter is, God sent him on this world-conquering mission in order to prepare the world for the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of this. When Alexander amassed all the other kingdoms, he was concerned about the many different languages and cultures. Therefore, he decided that he would Hellenize the world, which means he would bring them under Greek culture. This is enormously important and necessary. Consequently, he established the Greek language, which we know today as Koine Greek. He taught all of the people he had conquered this language and culture so they would know how they were supposed to live. This is the reason why the New Testament is written in Greek. And this is the reason, because of Alexander the Great, why a Bible student needs to study Greek. Because of Alexander the Great. I find that absolutely fascinating. 
Also, you probably have heard of the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, written about 3 to 2 B.C. for, primarily for the Jews who were living in Egypt who spoke Greek but didn't speak Hebrew because Alexander the Great had Hellenized uh, the, the, the uh, modern world of that time. You look at that and you go, this is absolutely fascinating the way all of this came about. In fact, the Galilee region in the days of Jesus was predominantly this Greek culture. It was, it was Hellenized. You'll see that term sometimes as you're doing uh, Bible studies and you're hearing sermons. It's the Jews in the Galilee region were Hellenized Jews. The Greek culture and the Greek language, uh, although you had the Romans who came in there, uh, it was Alexander the Great who prepared everything. In fact, um, it, uh, in the, um, if you've been to Israel before, you've heard of the Decapolis. The Decapolis is ten cities in the region of, of uh, the, Gal- the Sea of Galilee, all, all that area up there. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the cities of the Decapolis was Beit Shan. Um, it's the area where Jonathan and uh, his father Saul were killed and their bodies were hung on the city gates. But the Greek name of that became known as Skitapolis. Uh, it's an incredible place to go and visit. Uh, another city of the, of the Decapolis, Deca, uh, Dec meaning ten, uh, Decapolis, uh, the ten Greek cities, um, the, uh, it was uh, a Gadara. That's the place where, you remember where the, the, uh, the, yeah, the demon-possessed man in the, uh, in the cemetery, and uh, the demons were cast out of him and his friend, if you read the, uh, both Gospels, and the demons were cast out into the pigs, and, the, uh, and you had the case of deviled ham, remember that? And the pigs went over the cliff into the Sea of Galilee, and they drowned. Uh, so that was part of the Decapolis. But all of this is Alexander the Great preparing uh, everything. Alexander became so concerned about the ability to have access to his kingdom that he built vast highways and roads to all provinces over which he had control. When he died, the roads had been prepared for which the missionaries would travel and the language had been established in which the gospel could be written and preached. I find that fascinating. God had to raise up Alexander the Great having become this incredible conqueror by the age of 33 because he was using Alexander to prepare the way and literally prepare the roads for the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel to be taken all throughout the world. Eventually, you have the Romans come in and they're known as Roman roads, but those were all originally prepared by Alexander. The Greek culture, the Greek language, we have a Greek Bible. You start looking, you're going, man, all this, to also help the people speak this similar language when it came to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God used Alexander to prepare everything, and he, he, he like infused Alexander with this incredible mind and the ability to press forward. Um, now think of this, because I believe that we are rapidly being prepared right now. Uh, this article here says, uh, dark days ahead, global satisfaction with democracy hits an all-time low. Why is that? You and I are watching in America this rise of these socialists, and they're all over the place. You're thinking, man, the Democrat Party of today is not the Democrat Party of yesterday. It's totally different. And you look and you go, it has swung so far to the left. And if you try to bring a little bit of reason in there as a Democrat, you're going to be shouted down by radical socialists. So much so, it's affecting the thoughts of people in the world. Dark days ahead. Global satisfaction with democracy hits all-time low. I know this is the world being prepared, as the world is being prepared in the days of Alexander the Great. This is the government, the socialistic government, that has to come about during the days of the Antichrist and the coming new world order. God's preparing. We might not like it. Let me tell you, the Jews did not like much of what came out of the Greek empire. We'll get to that before we close here in a few minutes. But uh, then there's this, more preparation, right? Global tax talks to move forward. This also has to happen. 
this whole global system. Uh, Trump may be president. He's like trying to hold all this global stuff back, and Johnson, Boris Johnson and Benjamin Netanyahu, that's only going to last so long. The days are numbered. This world is being prepared for these things to come about. Um, and I also look at this. If you look at the, the tech industry, you have these people that aren't just millionaires. They aren't just billionaires. They are super billionaires. I'm convinced that God did that too. God opened up the bank, gave them these brains that were unbelievable, and made sure that they made a lot, uh, enough money off of everybody in the world, all right? I mean, this is technology. You know, that's technology. Your phone, everything is, right? So all this money, these are super, super billionaires. I believe it's real simple. God had to prepare the world for the technology that Revelation chapter 13 tells us regarding the mark of the beast. So like Alexander the Great, he infuses him at the age of 33 to conquer the, the, the civilized world. We see this happening now. It's the super billionaires who, who are creative and they fund the research and development centers to be able to build more and advance more and more technology. I don't believe governments would have done such a thing, spent that much money on technology. But these people who have all this money are realizing we can do more and more and more as private industry. And they've got vision. And they've got all of it. And all of it is coming about. And all of it had to come about. It had to come about. And then we have this with Alexander. We have the four generals. Uh, this is the last one before we get to the end. Note that verse 8 says that after, after the death of Alexander, four notable horns came up in place of the horn. So Alexander was the one horn. He dies at the age of 33. Four horns come up. Alexander, another reason why historians say this is impossible, Daniel had to be looking back and writing this. Alexander did not divide the empire among his four generals. By force, his four leading generals divided it among themselves after his death. You have Cassander, Lysimachus, I don't know how to say that. Will you guys forgive me for not knowing how to say that? Seleucus, the Seleucid kingdom, Ptolemy, um, and, uh, and then with these four generals, Alexander's dead, it's going to really start to go bad for the Jews. And uh, so we come to the last thing for tonight. Uh, it's the Holocaust, uh, verses 9 through 14. And out of one of the four came a little horn. This sounds like the Antichrist, doesn't it? Uh, it's going to be a lot of correlations. We'll see that in two weeks. Um, out, of, uh, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him, that's the Lord, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this sounds a whole lot like Daniel chapter 9, when the temple is rebuilt and, um, and then uh, the sacrifices are ended. But Antio uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is the one who's being talked about here. We'll see that in a second. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. And he did all this, and he prospered. Um, that's talking about the Jews and coming against the Jews, and slaughtering the Jews. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Verse 14, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. So we're going to stop here for tonight, but 2,300 days comes out to just a little over six years. And that cleansing there, that's Hanukkah. You ever heard of that? That's what that is right there. Um, so, so what is going on here? Um, don't have much time. I'd love to get into this later, so we will get into it later. But again, you have the four generals that come up. Uh, but out of the four generals, we have the, this one little horn 
He comes up out of the Seleucid kingdom. He rose great toward the south, the east, and the glorious land. The glorious land is the land of Israel. Okay, what does it mean, here we just read it, that it grew up to the host of heaven, cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars, and trampled them. This is a prophecy about Antiochus Epiphanes. He is a wicked, wicked man. He is a prototype of the Antichrist. So if a person wants to get a good idea of what the Antichrist is going to be like, you can look at uh, the prophecy here of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, with this man, God gives the world previews of coming attractions. Um, and it would be, um, we see this prophecy was fulfilled in the past, the one we just read, but a lot of the prophecies have a dual fulfillment. This is one of them. In fact, there's proof. Because in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, you'll know that the end has come, right? So Jesus was prophesying into the future with the Antichrist, yet Antiochus Epiphanes, who we're reading about right here in Israel's past before Jesus, a few hundred years before Jesus, he committed the abomination of desolation. Antiochus is a prototype of the coming Antichrist. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes gave himself his own name, Antiochus, meaning God manifest. Uh, he claimed that he was God. Um, uh, the Antichrist is going to do this also and demand that you worship him. After trying to conquer the world but being stopped by the Roman armies, Antiochus uh, turned his fury on Jerusalem. He killed 80,000 Jews, sold 40,000 into slavery. He set out to rid the world of the Jews and the Jewish religion. Instead of the Feast of Tabernacles, he brought into the temple the Feast of Bacchanalia, the worship of Bacchus, the god of pleasure. He forbade the observance of Sabbath and the reading of Scripture. He burnt every copy of the Torah that he could find. Hence, he's eliminating the worship of the God of heaven from Israel. If the Jews worshipped or practiced anything Jewish, they were e executed. This is the Antichrist, a picture of him coming. The Jews were forbidden to practice circumcision, and history records that there were two mothers who, because of their deep commitment to their Jewish culture, they circumcised their boys. When Antiochus heard about it, he took the babies, he killed them, he hung them around each mother's neck, then he marched the women through the streets of Jerusalem up to the highest wall, and there the women and their babies were thrown headlong over the precipice. Another is recorded that there was a mother who had seven sons who defiled Antiochus' law regarding worship. He cut out their tongues, in front of their mother, fried them to death on a flat iron one at a time, and then their mother was murdered. It is no, uh, it's no wonder that the Jews hated him, and he was evil, and he's a preview of coming attractions. But it was this, at the end of those days, what was it, 2,300 days, I think it said, um, that you have the rise of the Maccabees and uh, coming in, and, and in getting rid of the Greeks, and they're able to uh, get the temple back and cleanse the temple with the miraculous oil for the menorah to burn for the eight days that was needed for the cleansing. Hence, a Hanukkah has four branches. It's a four branch, or eight branches, four on each side with the Hanukkah menorah, with the one uh, candlestick in uh, the middle, representing the eight days of cleansing. But I look at this, and I think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, he says, uh, look, you look at all of the events of the last days, you better be ready. Uh, and then I think of the words from Isaiah where God says, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. I want you to think about these things before we leave. Because that's a horrible thing to think of at the end, isn't it? We need a little bit of hope. But you look at that and you think that's awful. That's a holocaust of the past. Um, you need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God is in the soul-saving business, and God is saving souls. I hope America wakes up. Uh, we need it. But Damon Duck wrote just the other day, he gave several different reasons why he believes um, we are living in the last days. He says, one, 
shortly after the U.S., Mexico, and Canada reached an agreement on the USMCA, um, that's the United States, Mexico, Canada alignment, right? Remember, we talked about 10 nations. We've been talking about that here and how the world will be broken up into 10 blocks. That's what I believe. The USMCA totally fits this. Mexico's President Enrique Peña Nieto uh, tweeted that the agreement would consolidate the economic integration of North America. Just know this. Uh, just know that this economic agreement will be resurrected, or restructured, excuse me, into a political agreement at some unknown future date, and its leader, Damon says, will be one of the ten kings. That's the same way I lead also. The ten kings of Revelation chapter 17. The ten tones, toes of Daniel chapter 2. The ten horns of Daniel chapter 7. The new world order. You look at this and you go, man, we are close. Two. On January 23, scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds before midnight. That's the closest they have been since the, clock, the doomsday clock started. It's the closest it's ever. The group cited Iran, climate change, cybersecurity as reasons. Iran, natural disasters, and the surveillance society are a major prophecies. Three, a group of world leaders called the World Economic Forum meets every year in Davos, Switzerland. I'm sure some of you follow that. On January 23, during a private dinner, uh, George Soros warned the group that the fate of the world rests upon the 2020 U.S. election. You look at this and you go, it's, I mean, you, you wonder. I mean, uh, Trump just keeps moving forward. If he gets four more years, it's going to wreak havoc for the globalists. His desire to get rid of Trump is an important part of his globalist agenda, and it's easy to believe how important the next election really is. Four, uh, for several years, some prophecy teachers have taught that Antichrist and false prophet will establish a cashless society. This is interesting. In the third week of January, it was reported that New York City has joined San Francisco, Philadelphia, and the states of New Jersey and Massachusetts in requiring stores to accept cash as well as debit cards, because stores are starting to say, we don't want cash anymore. So stores are now having to say, you must accept cash. You can see it's not far before we're going to be cashless, right? But pretty soon they're going to say, you must still sell uh, cassette recordings or something. Who knows? <laughs> Five. During the tribulation period, the rider on the pale horse will kill one-fourth of the people uh, uh, with the sword and with famine, uh, pestilence, or plague. It's too early to tell, but there has been this outbreak of the coronavirus. 50 million people have been quarantined. I believe that number's gone up. Some health officials say the risk of pandemic is low at this time. Others say it's too late to even stop it. Uh, we're waiting to see what, God happens on, uh, what, what happens on that. Number six, the rapture will be before the tribulation. Amen. The tribulation period will begin when Antichrist confirms the covenant with many for peace and safety in the Middle East. President Trump released his peace proposal on January 28, as it is written. We already talked about this a little bit. It is not the covenant of the Antichrist. Uh, the Antichrist will confirm because it calls for negotiations. But the fact that it calls for negotiations leave, leave the open possibility that the proposal will be changed and it could lead to that particular covenant. Something that could be very significant is the fact that U.S. and Israeli officials continue to emphasize that one of the main aspects of President Trump's proposal that it, is that it takes Israel's peace and safety into account. Uh, if, if you know your Bible, in the New Testament, uh, uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. And this is all part of the framework of this peace plan. And then he continues, he says, it calls for a four-year freeze on Israeli construction of settlements but that could possibly be extended. Uh, seven years might make it very interesting, he writes. What do we have? A seven-year covenant, right? Wow. Simply put, this is a historic moment, and Trump has started a whole new ball game that could trigger several major wars and the judgment of God. Seven, Trump created a map to show the borders of the two states. President Trump's borders are one thing, God's borders are another, and God's borders will prevail. It's impossible to know what God will do, but it seems clear that the U.S. can't support a division of the promised land and get away, uh, get away with it, because God says, 
I will judge those who divide my land. Then he says, much prayer and repentance is needed. And then he just sums it up with this. Listen to this. It's been estimated that wildfires have burned 46 million acres in Australia. In the third week of January uh, 2020, hail the size of golf balls fell in Australia. Hail mixed with fire was one of the ten plagues in Egypt in Moses' day. Also, a 186-mile-wide dust storm driven by gusts up to 66 miles an hour turned daylight into darkness. A 186-mile-wide dust storm. That's really wide to me. Three days of darkness was another one of the ten plagues of Egypt and Moses' day. Also about the same time, I'm sure some of you have heard about this, a swarm of locusts, 37 miles long and 25 miles wide, struck Kenya. This was another one of the ten plagues in Egypt uh, in Moses' day. And he says, God may be telling us his prophetic word is true and reminding us that there are more prophetic fulfillments to come and quite frankly, we, we better be ready. Listen, the word, God's word tells us these things. Not to scare us, but to prepare us. Some of the things I talk about, I don't really like talking about them because they give me bad dreams. I got to deal with this stuff every day. You guys just show up on Sunday night, get to have a hamburger and go home. I gotta, I'm going to go home tonight and be thinking of more stuff. What scary things can I tell? No, I'm just telling you the facts. I just bring out, this is what the Bible says. This is what's going on in the world. Let's connect the dots because the Bible gives us these things as signs so we can know that we are ready. And God is saving more people now than it, in, in, in the Mideast, in China, in Africa, and it's just a remarkable thing. May God save more souls in America. Amen?